Hello, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2014 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Anand Narayan, who is the head of Selco Labs at the Selco Foundation in India. My name is Yana Randa, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not moderating webinars, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where I am a senior program manager in the Engineering for Global Development Department. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar. Prototyping is a necessary but often difficult hurdle in product development. Uh, this is especially pronounced in the agricultural sector for organizations designing and delivering low-cost agricultural devices to underserved communities. In the case of southern India, Farmers don't often have the time, patience, or desire to test out prototypes of tools that could eventually increase their livelihood. So how can a design team make forward progress? To answer some of these questions, we invited today's presenter, Anand Narayan, to share his insights. And we thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series. In addition to myself, we have Mike Mater of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, and Steve Welch of IEEE. We work together on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics or speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presenter, we would like to take a minute to remind you about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a global community of over 20,000 technically-minded members and more than 140,000 social media followers, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, or other areas faced by underserved communities worldwide. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies such as ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, just to name a few, as well as academic supporters such as MIT D-Lab, international development agencies such as USCID, EWB USA, and Practical Action, and access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy, and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars page. You can see the link on the slide right there. In addition, archive is available on YouTube. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to also invite you to join the conversation with the hashtag E4C webinars. E4C's next webinar will be on June 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard with Elliot Kotek, who is the editor-in-chief of Not Impossible Lab. We're very excited to be talking on the subject of 3D printing and development, specifically focusing on the impact of this new technology along with some of the challenges. Stay tuned to the E4C webinars page for updates on the presenters and registration details. If you are already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation directly to the webinar soon. So as some of you have undoubtedly noticed, if, if you've joined us before, we are using a new webinar platform. We're excited to introduce you to a few of the new features the software has. On the screen, you are now seeing we have outlined a different widgets you will see on the dashboard at the bottom of this screen. The group chat is where you will interact with your fellow attendees and post any comments about the webinar. The Q&A widget 
allows you to submit any questions that you may have for the presenter. The help widget is to be used if you're having technical difficulties. It has a few resources on how to use the new software as well as answers to frequently asked questions. The slides widget and media player widget go hand in hand. These are windows that are allowing you to view and hear the slide webinar. The contact us widget enables you to email us right from this window. The Twitter icon sends you directly to post to Twitter. And the speaker bio is where you can find a little bit more about our presenter for the day. Share This is where you can share this webinar with your friends and colleagues through 13 popular social media sites. And lastly, the survey icon allows you to take our survey and tell us what you think of this presentation. Now I know this is a lot of information, so always feel free to scroll over to the icons for a reminder of what the icon is. A few housekeeping items before we get started. We'd like to help you get familiar with the group chat by seeing where everyone is from today. So in the group chat window, we invite you to type in your location now. All right, we see, I see Boston, I see Trinidad, Caracas, Venezuela, and many more. Very cool. Thank you all for joining us from all over. We welcome you. Moving forward, any technical questions or administrative questions should go in the Q&A window. But always feel free to use the chat window to talk amongst yourselves. You can view the Q&A window by clicking the Q&A widget located at the bottom of the screen. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window to type in your questions for the presenter. If you encounter any troubles viewing or hearing the webinar, you may also want to try opening up the webcast delete in a different browser. Also, feel free to access the help widget for technical help. At the bottom of the screen, it will remind you that you have the survey widget. It is a red icon with a checklist. Please make sure to take a moment before the end of the webinar to fill out our survey. Your opinions are invaluable to the webinar series. Without your comments and suggestions, this series won't be what it is today. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour, or PDH, for this session, please follow the instructions at the top of our webpage on engineeringforchange-webinars.org. So I'd like to introduce to you today's presenter. Ananda Ryan is the head of Selco Labs at the Selco Foundation. Selco Labs is an initiative founded in 2009 to plug the last mile gaps in innovation for the social sector, working particularly in areas of clean energy, clean energy access, livelihood technologies, water, in addition to experiential learning for students. Anand has substantial experience in working with decentralized renewable energy and appropriate technologies, both within academia and in industry. Anand completed his Bachelor of Technology at the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras and obtained a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder. So without further ado, I will push it over to Anand. Thank you for the introduction, Yana. So, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to start by just going over the rough agenda for today's webinar, and then I'll get straight into it. I'll start by talking about the organization Selco and, 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 and what we are trying to do, uh, followed by a brief introduction to the problem, the goals of what we are trying to achieve in this project, the challenges that we encountered as we started working on our agricultural machines, and the rough methodology that we evolved uh, to overcome those challenges, a few other considerations that it would be good to have, uh, have in mind, um, what success might look like. Um, and then we can go for questions. Um, starting with Selco. So Selco is structured as a non-profit organization. We are, we are a spun-off from a very successful social enterprise, uh, Selco Solar, that does decentralized uh, solar lighting that's touched about a million people in the southern state of Karnataka. Selco Foundation, which conducted this work, is registered as a public charitable trust. Uh, we envision a socially sustainable society uh, we want market-based solutions which are financially sustainable, which are culturally and socially acceptable, as well as environmentally sustainable. Broadly, our mission uh, and, and the work we do involves the needs identification of underserved communities in, in the areas of decentralized energy and appropriate technology. We work on creating innovative and sustainable solutions, and we want to foster ecosystem development in the social sector. Uh, coming to the introduction of this specific problem itself um, about small-scale agricultural machinery for smallholder farms. 
when we started this work, we found that while there was a bewildering variety of mobile phones and other technologies, somehow the choice in small scale agri machines was just not there. As we started looking into the problem, we, we, we realized that extension work is fundamentally very difficult. So we have a large agricultural research sector um, in India that has worked largely on new farm practices, new crop varieties. But somehow there has been little research on agricultural machines per se, and what little work there has been has not yielded useful solutions that have come to market. Um, we realized that very early on. We did go around talking to a lot of the, uh, you know, the players in the sector, and then and so in our own small way, we were, we are we work largely in a paddy area with a lot of smallholder farms. Um, so we said, let's work on a suite of machines that can reduce. Um, labor requirements, increased profitability for farmers, in, and increasing the speed and the ease of performing the task of currently um, carried out agricultural tasks. So those were the goals that we started out with. Um, why is agricultural machines needed in, in the first place? One thing is various changes even in India and in rural India uh, means that in many parts of the country there is an acute labor shortage. So, which is a reality different from say 20 or 30 years ago, where there was, at least there was a perception there's an excess of labor. But right now, uh, especially for crops like paddy, which are very labor intensive, one of the most common complaints is that you don't get the hands that you need for the time critical tasks that are required. Um, in conjunction with that, there's an unavailability of smart mechanized solutions. And as you dig deeper, you find that most of the agricultural research lacks um, farmer participation in in either the identification of the precise need, the testing of the of the solution to de determine its appropriateness, and and what's probably you know natural or ex to be expected is that large commercial entities which work in this sector prefer to concentrate on large scale farmers and their needs because you know it's much easier to do things. Um, in scale and you know it's easier to build a viable business model. So we started about three years ago on on a suite of machines. The specific machines we're talking about, some of which you'll see in pictures or in videos, is a paddy transplanter, a two-row paddy transplanter, um, a thresher for separating the straw from uh, from the from the grain, a dehusker, a light trap for insect protection. Um, and a harvester for um, reaping the crop. So when we started off, and, and I think one thing to keep in mind, and this may be true for many of you others who are uh, designing, is, is the perception that the machine needs to be ultra low cost, affordable, and, 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 I, and I've, I've encountered or many efforts or many organizations that done this, and we were no different. So when we started, the goal was to make a prototype as quickly as possible, get it out into the market and see. And one thing that's changed, though, is that, you know, lots of rural people, including in India, are used to high quality finished products. So, you know, our early approaches, we would hastily put together, you know, buy a barrel in the market, find something recyclable which while it's all very romantic you know one, one one thing we found is as soon as we started testing these bringing it to the machines the enthusiasm for the farmer in testing the machine itself dropped you know and 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 you know and when this happened once or twice we realized that this this is a pattern and that we would have to fix it so they were put off by the rough and unfinished look of the machines i mean they were not really used to the idea of a prototype so when we call them and tell them we're coming in for a test the expectation is is of a finished product and once you've lost that initial interest at at, um, at you know it was very hard to continue to get them to engage in the tests the other thing we discovered so you know, many machines like that you and I also use have multiple functions. So in order to get something out through the door and test quickly, you would have some, you know, maybe the most important part of the machine's functionality working and, and you take it for a test. Like, for example, in the thresher. So a typical thresher would also require a winnowing in order to separate the dust. Now, so the, again, the farmer's expectations is of multifunctionality. So even if you have an intent to put in winnowing later, sometimes the fact that you don't have it on during your first test can can hurt. Um, the other thing is, depending on the type of machine, um, there is a reluctance to try the machine on their own crop. 
uh, which is understandable because you know in the case of paddy this is the rice that they're going to eat for six months so often you know you come in you know here's a set of people that are you know coming with something that you know looks new and different and they're saying they're going to work on your fields so in the case of a transplanter for example there is a fear that you know are, are we going to damage the seedling so much that we are not going to have um, a, a yield or a, a much reduced yield so there was definitely this reluctance to try the machines and that's because there's a risk involved um, to the farmers um, and and like so and I, like I said, you know, definitely the, the the concept of prototype testing is a bit alien. So the rough and unfinished look was was a was a barrier. Uh, the part about them jumping to conclusions about the usefulness of the final product was a barrier. The other thing, so very soon, you know, you you take the machine, you demonstrate it, you, and then your next step is to give them, uh, give it to them, and try try for them to use it. We realized soon, soon that it's the equivalent of you know an average driver trying out a Formula One car in order to test its limits. So often the farmers are not used to a machine like this, and 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 some of these machines it, it takes a while to learn how to use the machine. Whereas the expectation both on your side as a tester and the farmer's side is that it's going to work right away. So you have that learning curve that somehow you need to overcome. So. Over time, what we actually decided to, we didn't do this in the beginning, over time what we evolved to is we would actually spend the money and, and you know, have a retainer farmer on our payroll who just got better and better with the machine. So later when you would go do the tests, you would have somebody experienced operating the machine which would give uh, a m much more uh, confidence. The other barrier, for example, we face in the transplanter is that for the transplanter to work, the seedlings had to be a certain size for it to optimally work and, 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 the, and for the paddy seedling to get um, transplanted. And that was all, you know, despite uh, lots of communication with the farmer, um, you know, you would land up for a test one day and find that the seedling is too long or too, or too small. If it's too long, you know, um, it, it will... You, you will it, it, the machine will not be able to pick it up if it's too small either too many seedlings get picked up or you have um, seedling damage both of which are not good um, for your test so based on a lot of these lessons that we learned and, and I think I should also point out that many of these lessons were learned over multiple seasons I mean one of the other barriers with testing agricultural machines is you have narrow windows so for example if it's transplanting um, in, 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 in the areas that we test you have two windows of uh, you know two months each that 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 you can test so um, you know and and so often if either your prototype is not ready in time you've missed the season so so it took us about two or three years to actually you know you know figure out that these were all very systemic challenges we were encountering and that we would have to overcome so as we started in the, you know down the road we started learning from these tests to, and then we started tailoring our tests and demonstrations a little better. So we realized like uh, that it was important to determine exactly what we wanted to achieve from a test and that we had to plan. Um, so it, the first and most important criteria which you know you might hear in different uh, you know whether it's human centered design or user centric design or you know whatever your uh, paradigm of choice is is understanding the precise need and pop popularity of a new product that you want to introduce. Uh, you know, now we use a combination of surveys, but we realize that often just user surveys in the abstract often have not worked in these type of communities because people don't want to give you feedback in the abstract. I mean, if you say, if I made a machine like this that would do this, would it be of use to you? Often we see a lot of blank stares. So we do see the need for a quick and tangible prototype that, that people uh, will react to. And if you are, if you want to gather feedback about a machine that you have not yet built, it might make sense to actually do a design or a model, and then you will find that people will react once you describe the functionality and and how something looks. Yes. So uh, the other, so the other thing that we do is we try not to take prematurely designed products for testing, 
and this is because you have a limited number of early movers or channels that you can test with so th these may be organizations who have opened up their groups of farmers to you for testing or they may be your own personal links or whatever prospective customers you know if you're in this for the long term there's probably a chance that you will have to go to these people again and again so you want to retain them for future tests so one is so so very clearly now we try to understand what the features that farmers would see as essential we try to build it in because it, you know there's a lot of potential embarrassment if your prototype does not work as the designer had expected so not only do you need to build all the functionality in but you need to be able to test it um, internally in a control setting so and this you can do through different ways you know if you have access to your own fields like in our case we have employees who have farms um, or and it may be worth 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 your while to actually just lease out and pay for somebody for the use of the crop because what you don't want to have have happen which has happened to us is you go with a machine that you think is going to work and is the first time you're trying it out it's somebody you don't know very well it's a lot of egg on your face for it you know if it's functioning at one tenth that of the performance that you know they're doing it by hand so so definitely try to understand the desirable features build those in test it in controlled settings and and there's always going to be agricultural universities or field extension farms or ngos that can get you the space the next is getting feedback from the farmers um on the features <clears throat> farmers will always of course be eager to have a go with the machine before they know how to you know use it properly i think it's important it's like i think i alluded earlier to having your own you know um staff retainer kind of farmers who have who use it it's good if they actually do a demonstration and then train them so that when the farmer is using it um there's a confidence you know in 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 their in 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 them being able to use it and use it properly the other thing we found is that the the cycles for the testing may not just be one season and you know and this has to do with basically either the, the fact that people are sometimes risk averse or that um, you know that or that it takes a while to get so sometimes we have found that it sometimes takes your third or fourth season of a farmer using it for them to build the confidence so i think it's important not to get disheartened too early so you you know figure out who which of your uh, for prospective testers are in it for the long run and take it back to them season after season because sometimes they're ready to work with you and 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 get the conditions right for example if the seedlings were not right you know try to go back and and do it again uh, and over time you, you know they will start being able to use the machine um, uh, un unsupervised the other thing we have found useful is to work with other agencies that the farmers trust So in our case we have a very large NGO uh, which works with you know mil a million or so farmers in Karnataka called SKDRDP we go you know if they are already organizing an event where their farmers are convening we try to do demos there to, in order to bring awareness to them we also use their channels for testing that also sort of implicitly builds the trust in your product and in you but like i pointed out earlier it's important not to misuse the trust So I'm going to now go and play um, a a slide for you, uh, a video that 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 is going to show you uh, one of the ways in which uh, one of the tests that we did. Again, I think it's important both as you know engineers trying to do a good job, or you know, or as companies trying to make sure you've built a product to the user requirement. Is that what you're building is actually a superior product? There is no substitute for quantifying performance. So what you're going to see in this video is 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 the traditional method of uh rice threshing with one of the most successful threshers that now seems to be gaining acceptance so in the foreground you're going to see the farmer who's who's a very much a localite trying out the machine um with 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 paddy in the background you're going to see the four women using the traditional technique what we went through is rigorously actually computed down to the gram uh, to in order to demonstrate to ourselves and and for future exactly how much faster the machine is over um, over the hand method Balance, we can use your scale. Our weight weighs 
Other considerations that we have learned along the way is that you have to have staff, you, you can't give the machine away to somebody and tell them, you know, give me feedback. It doesn't work that way. It's important to have your own staff. We have actually found that it's often useful to have the original designer of the machine present for the early test so that, because obviously that person has a lot of insight into the machine, can ask more probing questions of the farmer um, to better understand what changes or improvements may help and also answer questions uh, for farmers' feedback. It's also many, very often you know your next rev. I mean, you know, the commonly used phrase of, you know, failing early and failing often. You know, definitely it helps to have the designer because, you know, at the end of that phase itself, you might be able to go back to the drawing board for your next revision. Um, those of you working with, you know, communities like this will probably understand the importance of communication. So time and again, we thought we had communicated um, what we wanted from the farmer about the length of the seedlings that were required or the soil conditions to find that sometimes, you know, when you go there finally for the test, having spent the money to go there, the conditions were not right. Now we've just decided just to be, you know, better prepared and we actually send somebody to verify. So we don't just take somebody's word for it. If the seedlings need to be 18 centimeters, we send somebody four days ahead to make sure that it's, it's within that limit on the day we test. And this can be frustrating because there are times we've had, and, and this is true for, I think, maybe cultures where either, you know, they're not, you know, their timing depends on various factors. Sometimes you've scheduled a test and you realize, if, if they, you know, they've gone away for some local village festival. So I think the importance is to stay on top of it. One thing we have found is to not multitask too much and have dedicated staff that is helping organize these things. That helps these things go more on schedule. So communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, timing, please let the farmers know how long they're testing. I mean, you know, pay attention to their resources and their schedule. Uh, you know, even though it's in your interest to get this tested, you will need to understand what are their constraints. And often they will be constraints because, you know, if it's raining, they may not want to do threshing because, you know, the paddy is wet. So you, you just definitely understand the problem and, and communicate um, about when it can be scheduled. We never, uh, about payment for testing. So we actually consciously decided not to pay farmers because we wanted, we wanted the fact that they had some skin in the game, you know, because <clears throat> I mean, too often, you know, the development sector is riddled with, I mean, people are too polite. If you paid them for the test, they're not going to say that this machine sucks, you know. Um, so it, it is important that I think you not pay too much, but definitely we do offer to reimburse for any losses. I mean, because it, to be fair to them, you know, it's a, you know, it's not fair for them to take a risk on some machine that you know you've designed. So we always say that you know, if there's a loss, we will you know we will make sure we make you whole, and 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 this has helped. I mean, you know, not paying obviously reduces the number of farmers who are willing to test. But we have found that those farmers who are interested enough will come forward, and it makes for a much better test. Soon you'll find out that you know, once there's an acceptable machine, there will be others. Um, who are ready to rent it and, and that will give you insight into whether um, this machine is actually meeting customer demand. Aesthetics of the machine, like I, I think I mentioned it earlier, is very important because you, you know, because there is an expectation of what a machine looks like and I think it is well worth our while to make sure the prototypes look attractive and properly finished and I guarantee you that you will have a much better response from the farmers. You may have to use different channels. A lot of our time we spend at um, at farmers' melas where groups of farmers are anyway coming. They are used to these channels as a way of of getting to know machines. A lot of sales may not happen, but I think it's 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 a way of branding your machine and making sure that you're getting the word out um, that 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 your machine exists and and that familiarity with the machine will make them more keen to test your machine or other machines that you might make down the road. And, you know, so these are some of the guidelines and, you know, and I have to say that, you know, uh, in our own efforts in this, we, we, we actually have, finally I can say that, you know, the rays of light are just sort of breaking through the horizon. We are, we are seeing signs of early success and, and, you know, a lot of this path of three years has mostly been very uphill, you know, encountering these challenges that, that I'm, I'm, I'm telling, I mean, I wish somebody had told us all this when we started, so hopefully we're, you know, saving some time of of some of you who are trying to do this. 
when you when you evolve to the right solution the customer pull is usually very evident you know you will easily see at that point that you're meeting and solving some customer pain unfortunately this can take two or three years because it may be four or five growing cycles before you get there it could also be that we were not um, addressing the problem in enough scale so i mean like any other problem it's important to use the appropriate resources in the appropriate scale to solve the problem in many cases i think we had um, underestimated the amount of work that would be required and that made things go a little longer than it needed to have eventually and now we are actually finding the thresher is now you know in high demand we have people calling us uh, saying we want to buy more of these and 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 so we are able to see what success looks like we are now spending the time to actually set up different structures because a lot of what i've gone into is is kind of an r&d effort you know soft funded r&d effort because nobody who's trying to make a short term profit is going to invest this kind of time um for these kind of machines which often may not have the kind of margins required required to build a very high profit business so uh, but then ha- sales and rentals and reaching the market may not be best done through a non profit so even a non profit like us is looking at what kind of partnerships with distributors and other sales channels do we need to explore um, in order to take this machine uh, machines further and uh, and 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 i hope you know many of you also see this kind of success and in our case we are seeing these machines not only being sold we're seeing other farmers come to the machines come to the farmers who have bought our machines and are renting it from them um um uh, for paying a fee and the transport cost at that point you definitely know that uh, you know something is working um i'm going to play you another uh, so where where we are now we're now trying to you know uh, do the marketing and create the appropriate marketing material to spread the word i'm going to play a video for you that will show you both the thresher and the transplanter and um, and how we are uh, reaching the farmer um and s- since it's in kannada i'm going to translate for you it just says elko foundation um rural lab uh here we talking about we have a picture of local farmers using the machine and telling them the rate in the video snap you have the side by side comparisons of the traditional method and the machine um so that you know th- that builds the credibility that you know that that we know what the traditional method is and what the what we are benchmarking against um we are you know talking about the benefit saying it's simple and easy to use and easy to carry and we have a shot of uh, two farmers carrying the machine um we are quantifying the fact that uh, the, you know you can double the productivity and now we come to the transplanting machine where we talk about uh, the the benefits of the transplanting machine there's a short video of uh, a farmer using our machine in a in, in a typical paddy field and and this is one of those uh, farmers that we had trained and kept as a retainer uh, so that you know it when it's when he's when you when you're demonstrating it's a fluid motion we talk about the productivity increases that are possible uh, the fact that it's very portable and can reach small farms easily um, you know uh, and 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 the fact that it has been tested uh, l- under local conditions and and we, and in the case of the transplanter we are actually showing the before and after saying that despite you know transplanting with the machine 9 weeks later the the seedlings look healthy and then there is the information about how to contact us couple of references and if you have any questions you can always reach me by email at um, anand@selcofoundation.org um, I, i look forward to any questions that you may have um, by email So uh, at this point I I'd, I'd like to uh thank Anand um and also uh let everybody know that he is available to answer questions as of now. If uh you have a detailed question I would like to also send him his contact information is noted on the slide. So I'm going to uh go over to our Q&A window. I've, I've seen a number of questions come in already. Uh so I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with them and on end we'll tackle them one by one as we start finish a little bit earlier than expected 
so uh, we have a little bit more time to chat with you all. So question number one uh, comes um, here. Uh, does not urbanization and rapid industrialization mean a diminishing market for such devices? Anand, would you let us know, please? Yes, uh, thank you. That's a good question, actually. So, um, yes, urbanization, so it's actually interesting. So urbanization is actually leading to a very large uh, shortage of labor in many areas in India. So, you know, if, if you go back to the philosophy of Gandhian philosophy for, say, 20, 30 years ago, I think automation was considered bad of any kind, in, even including small, because you wanted to maximize labor availability. But now, at least for paddy intensive crops like, I mean, for very labor intensive crops like paddy, because of urbanization and migration, you don't have enough work, uh, enough of a labor force to support these. So, you actually, ha and so you're actually targeting people many of whom are either growing it for emotional reasons that, you know, they've been small farmers, they've been growing their own rice for generations, they want to continue, or you might hit idealists that want to grow their own food. So it's a very small segment. So it's a niche. Uh, like if, if, for example, in our district where we're testing in Dutch in Canada, um, paddy production is probably down 70, 80% from, say, 20 or 30 years ago. So uh, that's the answer. So urbanization has led to a... It is a, it's not a very large market. I mean, so, you know, I think one thing that we learned early on, um, depending on which uh, sector you're working in, in agricultural machines, probably is not, a, the single version of the device is probably not going to be as universally accepted as, as say, a cell phone. But, but, but the short answer to your question is yes, it does mean a diminishing market, but it's also created a market for such devices which didn't exist a few years ago. Fantastic. Thank you. So another question that came in was regarding need finding, and we're talking about here the design process. Was the need finding exercise done systematically before you set out to develop the product, and were the farmers able to articulate their needs? Uh, okay. So, so in the early days, Yana, I think need finding was not as systematic as we do it now. I mean, we just went with our gut feeling um, of what might gain acceptance, um, you know, much like a Steve Jobs would, you know, try to do. Um, but but later we found that, you know, that was obviously a dangerous part because, you know, you're not a small farmer yourself and there is a need for systematic need assessment. Having said that, we actually did a little bit of a chicken and egg because I think if you go to the abstract and ask a farmer what machine would, would you buy or what do you feel a gap, um, you know, they would not be very ready with, some kind of a description. So we had to either you know, ideate, propose, propose functionality, sometimes do pictures, um, and then arrive at what, what, would, what would be needed. So we've evolved to a path where we are now a lot more systematic, and we repeat this exercise. That, you know, we participate in, in farmer melas where you have anything between 20 or 100,000 farmers walking through your stall. And uh, at that time, we keep testing, and you know, and, and and sometimes you also find that you know the the, the demand also changes. You know, it, it's kind of a moving um, moving problem. But but yes, you know, to the question, there is definitely a need for systematic need finding and confirmation and validation of market size and things like that. Thank you. Well, we have a, a number of questions that come in, so it's very exciting. Thank you, guys. Uh, one question here is, and I think our video would have showed some of this, but uh, we'll let Anand speak to it, is specifically how do you get farmers to uptake the machine when they may not see the profit from it until more than one growing season? Well, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, unless I can read sure. it. I'm not... No, no worries. I can, I can repeat it. Oh, ah, okay. How I, do you I, get I, I farmers... Yeah, yeah. Oh, you see it? <laughs> okay, great. Right, so so I think it depends on the machine again. So the 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 you know the the pressure is interesting, and I think we found that maybe the reason the pressure got acceptance faster is, you know, on a single day they see the result of the test. Right, they can see what is the productivity of the hand, uh, you know, the the traditional method, and they can see the productivity using the machine. So on day one they see that they'll half their cost, and 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 that's the profit essentially because the starting point is the same, and you and you've ended up with the same amount of paddy. Things get a little trickier for something like the transplanter because you finish transplanting and your yield is going to be four months later and there are so many parameters that influence yield. So it's very hard to trace it down to a single parameter. You know, in, in our case, we could, we could see that there was significant cost saving by the use of the machine. However, 
we had to run the test for two growing seasons to convince ourselves and the others that there's no loss of yield because if you if you if you drop the cost but instead um you've uh, you know reduced the yield a lot more you might actually end up causing a loss and, and in my and in our experience that has been a barrier to that machine being adopted at the same rate even if the cost savings is comparable got it all right so another question that came in um in your experience, have you noticed any resistance to a technology introduced by Westerners into rural India as opposed to, say, uh, a domestic uh, technology? Uh, not really. I mean, I think, though, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question completely because, you know, we've had a lot of Westerners in our test. I mean, we have lots of volunteers from various universities around, around the world, engineers without borders, and who all contributed significantly to the testing and the design. I have not seen any resistance, um, but then we, we were also there with them, and and uh, we even have locals on the team. So I can't complete. I cannot answer the question of what if you parachuted, a, you know, some Westerners into some into a place and they were trying to do this. What the experience would be, I wouldn't be able to tell. But I, I think it's going to be pretty tough. You're going to need some local channels to enter anyway, typically. Mm-hmm. So in in a kind of a different vein entirely, looking at a completely, uh, I guess, diametrically opposite approach, uh, one of our listeners is wondering if non-mechanical solutions are being or were considered. Um, As an example, uh, he shares the fact that there's a small farm in Northern California, which is about nine acres, has year-round production, permanent full-time employees, no tilling beyond organic, and 140 crops are grown. So did, did Selco Labs consider a non-mechanical solution? Okay, so yes, uh, you know, I, I, no, we, we've not considered, I mean, you know, I think uh, uh, they're a small team, but, you know, I think the approach is interesting, and, and there are some comparable uh, experiments being tried out, notably for Paddy called SRI method, which is a system for rice intensification, which is, you know, it's a few techniques. It's a different way of growing paddy, but primarily non non mechanical interventions. But you know, the answer is we did not try any non mechanical solutions or no till um, method uh, in in our work. And a question from the operations and maintenance side: How do you plan to service these machines? Um, the question is specifically around human resources and uh, what the in- who are the human resources will be to service these machines? Okay, so and so I, I think I must have mentioned earlier in the presentation that you know Selco, uh, the foundation is a spin-off from a, a, for a social enterprise that does solar lighting, and one of the keys to the success in that market was the ability to service and maintain the solar systems that we that we provided to the customers. Definitely, service would be part of it, and. Uh, you know, having said that, we're still in the, you know, we've just gone through the early market penetration stage, so service would be a good problem to have, but we would uh, we would try to use existing capacities of whoever does repair of mechanical devices today, train them, and, 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 and uh, build out that service mechanism. But, but, but definitely servicing is a very important part of, uh, of uh, providing these machines. Couldn't agree with you more. So... One of the main trade-offs, of course, when you create prototypes uh, and uh, when you have to go through a number of iterations with hardware is uh, the cost associated with it. But also, uh, you know, you have to consider how to make these machines uh, aesthetically pleasing. So one of our listeners would like to know what some of the methods you incorporated in making a prototype aesthetically pleasing without adding significant cost. Uh, well, so you know, I, I, so I, I, I don't think. I mean, you know, we paid heavy attention to aesthetics, but I think our learning that I alluded to was that you know you can't have something looking very amateurish. So you know, typically if it's a powder coated finish or it's something, that, you know, I don't think the farmer's expectation is of a really a uh, uh, you know a shiny gadget. But having said that, so you know, because they're used to finished products like that, just have to up the bar compared to what you would do. So, you know, I'm in, in none of our machines have we paid a lot of attention to aesthetics beyond, say, a clean and professional-looking finish. So that, again, would be a next stage 
once you identify that the market is large and, and you're going to go in for production and scale. Got you. So we have a question regarding funding. So does India support the funding of the machine design and prototyping process, or where else do you access prototype development funding? I'm sure we could talk about funding for a while. <laughs> well, so India, in, in theory, yes, India does have funding, and the, and the university system has been funded. I think India has a, a center for agricultural machine research um, in, in India. Again, I mean, India is a large country. The, the agricultural machine testing center is in the middle of the country, and even to order a machine, no local farmer would even know the language probably of Hindi to get that machine. So there's a lot, there's a lot of last mile barriers at accessing many of these innovations. Um, our work was actually not funded by within India. Um, bulk, mo most of our funding for this work has come from the Lemelson Foundation um, in Oregon, um, and 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 and. and and though we have tried to get additional funding from other sources for agricultural machines. Very good. Another question is regarding introduction um, of the technology. Have you successfully introduced um, processing technology in the context of labor surplus? Well, I don't know if we would. In none, in none of our areas, I think, you know, as part of our need assessment, you know, we try to understand what the customer pain would be. And so our... Our work with introducing small-scale machinery has been in areas where uh, there's a labor shortage. Now, um, we have done some other work looking at food processing and post-processing. The biggest barrier I think we face there in that work, which is very different from anything I've talked about today, is, is on the market linkage side. You know, for producer groups or people working at the ground level to be able to, you know, uh, get get and break open the market for a, you know, for a newly and innovative product has not been easy, but, but, but we continue to make those efforts. So we have an interesting question here regarding fuel. Um, are your machines, our cell phone machines, uh, I know that most of them are fossil fuel based, but the question is regarding your future directions, I suppose, or current directions. Uh, is Selco making an effort to limit carbon emissions somehow and to perhaps move away from fossil fuel? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Selco broadly, you know, I mean, the bread and butter of Selco still is the solar lighting where, you know, there is some amount of carbon emission offset. In our work, we have not focused on that. And I think I see another question around, I mean, when we introduce these machines, you know, I, you know, I, I, I would joke about it at, at, at many meetings. We started introducing uh, you know, most of these machines with a pedal, you know, as the pedal as the main of, of you know, operations that way you're, you know, um, at least carbon neutral to the old operation. And the first feedback you would get from most farmers is, can you please fix a motor? And I think when I put myself in their shoes, they're already working hard, you know, through the day, unlike most of us. So I think, you know, they're also on the same path of being able to reduce, you know, manual work if they can. Um, so we've not linked this work to you know, explicitly to any carbon emission. But we are conscious. I mean, we are very conscious. And one of our research areas that we would like to go to is how can we design these machines with the least amount of power possible, so that you can you can you know you can have a tribal food you know agricultural processing center uh, which is solar powered. Because what we would hate is for the acceptance of this machine to also involve um, diesel or any other fossil fuel to go along. So we're sensitive to that question, but. But I, I think if you try to solve too many problems, you will solve, you know, none of them. Certainly. That makes good sense. Um, one of the things that's kind of uh, a good insight is a question regarding safety. So we know that modern equipment has many safety requirements. How is the potential liability from accidents mitigated if items like safety shields <laughs> Oh, excuse me. I apologize. Um, if items like safety shields are not included in prototypes. Hmm. No, a good question and something we have encountered. I think one of our earlier versions of the pressure, you know, when we built it out, you know, and when we were testing it out, the first thing was I was a little scared because this thing was whirring around at a high speed and, you know, uh, you know when, when I was a little worried that along with the straw, your hands would get sucked into the into the spinning wheel and you hurt yourself. But, I mean, frankly, that didn't happen. We did say that for the next drive, we would have to take care of the safety. Um, uh, safety issues by putting in some kind of shield. Now, you know, uh, unfortunately, there isn't a standard for many of these machines, but I think it behooves anybody designing these uh, um, these machines to, you know, pay attention to safety issues and at least make sure that children don't 
accidentally hurt themselves or even the adults. And I'm saying this fully conscious of the fact that I think, you know, uh, I do realize that one of the most dangerous professions, even I think in, in the U.S., was agriculture in terms of the number of accidents in the job that happened. And, and that's from far, from farmers, you know, they handle a lot of heavy machinery and are not necessarily trained in the same manner that factory workers would be. Okay. Uh, so the, the last part of the question was around liability. You know, I, liability, I mean, we're aware of it, but, you know, I think the issue, liability is not, you know, sadly or happily, depending on what camp you are on, not a very big issue in India in these devices. Having said that, I think we, we do pay attention to it, but the potential liability has not been on top as much as this broad issue of safety. Um, one interesting question, swinging over to the business side of deploying agricultural devices, uh, there's a question regarding IP or intellectual property. How safe is IP in India if it has been applied through a PCT patent application in India? Um, and it's been patented in other countries. I'm not familiar with PCT applications, but maybe you can speak that on it. That's the patent cooperation treaty, Yana. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, so, yes, good question. And I, I, and I think I should, uh, you know, I, I, this is an anecdote. From a few years ago, there was this uh, local workshop designing a machine for making jackfruit chips. And, you know, I, I would see this machine in his, in his uh, workshop every time we went for our other prototypes, maybe over a year. And he said, uh, and I asked him, why is it taking so slow? He said, you know, you know, this work is very hard to figure out how it works. And then once it successfully works, someone's just going to copy it anyway. Uh, so in general, IP is not necessarily safe. I mean, and, and I should also point out, for this market, you know, even your detection of infringement is going to be so difficult that I normally would advise people that, you know, unless, I mean, I think you should go and file a patent for the sake of, you know, getting that ownership and attaching your name to it. But as a value proposition, uh, and I should also add that, you know, I do have a background as a patent agent, but I would, you know, I would not put my money in patenting a small scale application. Uh, just detecting infringement and by the time you go through the court system, if you're not located in India, it's going to be a very long uh, haul. Having said that, India is part of the PCT. You will get a patent if it meets, meets the criteria for patentability. And if you, maybe you can speak a little bit uh, around the business model, expanding further, what is the overall business model for developing and marketing your machines? I know we had a video to show uh, an example of that, but maybe if you can speak to that. Okay. Um, a good question to which, you know, we don't have a complete answer. So when we started our work about three years ago, um, we realized that the model thinking at that time was that, and, and one of the reasons that this kind of work needs to be, you know, publicly funded in whatever manner is that the, the, the path to actually getting the market is very long. The possible profits are not very high, which means the mainstream market forces typically would not invest their capital in the development of the machine. I would say that a non-profit foundation is probably the wrong uh, exit mechanism. So we've either thought about identifying a, a series. So we're still debating between distributed manufacturers who we transfer the IP and do some kind of design support and quality support who then um, service the, the local areas they work in, or we're equally open to a centralized model of manufacture um, that, that then goes through traditional agricultural machine distribution channels. I don't think we see ourselves as the foundation being the marketing entity eventually. This, uh, this year we're experimenting actually where we've found one or two, uh, you know, fairly good uh, players, small businesses who are into agricultural machines and we're trying to enter into a memorandum of understanding where, you know, we transfer the design to them and they do the marketing. I mean, and, you know, there's no money exchange between either entity. So we're going to take uh, the question in uh, questioning in so a little bit of a different direction. Going away from the business model, one of our listeners uh, would like to know if you see any applications of electrical and computer engineering within the agriculture sector in developing nations specifically, or maybe you can speak to what you've seen in India. Electrical and computers. Um, I think it's a bit of a – I think it's probably one of the – I mean, there are methods now, you know, I don't think we are working on them, but people like ITC, the use of, you know, information to bridge markets with producers, I think there's enough good ideas that, is, that are out there uh, that, uh, that, that people are doing. Um, electrical engineering actually would, I mean, you know, if we had, you know, one of the gaps we do find is 
good DC machine. So on the electrical motor side, there's a fair bit of work. Um, one thing, you know, uh, I hear Telco point out is most machines have been designed with the grid in mind. So, you know, which makes, you know, which makes renewable energy very difficult to attach to many of these machines because they've all been designed as if powered in matter. So I think it's a, it's a much longer, you know, this is a much tougher problem than even what we are trying to solve. But there is, it is worthwhile to look at, you know, if somebody can do the work by hand, you should be able to do that work with 150 watts of power. You know, and that's a very affordable, um, you know, a solar panel to many, many communities. So that's where I would say the entry point in agriculture would be probably in the lines of machines for processing um, on, on, and, you know, efficient machines. And I think that's the best answer I have now. Um, of course, one of our uh, listeners is also interested in how uh, some of these processes relate to uh, Introducing innovation that applies to existing machinery that is at a larger scale. So he notes that you seem to be referring to innovations that address small scale or niche applications to replace primitive processes. Are different approaches for, uh, are there different approaches for introducing innovation that applies to existing machinery that would be tested in uh, the manufacturer's lab? Existing machinery, no. Hmm. So. No, I'm I'm trying to get my uh, head wrapped around the question. Um, yes, we are looking at. I mean, I, w I wouldn't say necessarily. I mean, okay, neat. I, I know I use the word, but it still could be tens of thousands of farmers, you know, in in one state in 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 a, in a country. Um, having said that, the approach for testing may not be too different. I mean, I'm sure that the approaches for the way the innovation develops would be would be different, but. Uh, and maybe it's not on, um, getting the question differently, or at least the test with the farmer, I think, would not would not be too different, um, you know, and would not depend on where the machine came from or what size application um, it is. Mm. It's, a, it's a bit of a tough question, I think, to to kind of conceptualize. And perhaps uh, for those of you who haven't seen your question answered, and there were a lot of questions. We had almost 30 questions that came in. So I apologize that we can't get to them all uh, today. However, please feel free to reach out to on directly or to webinars at engineeringforchange.org, and we will make sure to uh, share the questions with him and post answers. Um, all of you should be seeing now the thank you slide. We'd like to thank all of you for attending and remind you to please uh, share your feedback with us regarding this webinar uh, by using the survey widget at the bottom right hand of your screen. Uh, this was our first time trying out this new platform, so we apologize for any uh, any stumbles along the way. We hope to get better and smoother with our platform. For those of you who are just in getting your PDHs, the code is listed on the screen. Please follow the instructions on our webinars page on how to get your PDHs. And don't forget to become an E4C member to get information on our upcoming webinars. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing all of you on our next webinar on June 24th on 3D printing. I wish you all a good day or good evening wherever you may be. Take care now. Thank you. <laughs>